In the first episode, I talked about how and why I build Raspberry Pi clusters. I mentioned my Raspberry Pi Dramble cluster and how it's evolved over the past five years. In this episode, I'm going to show you how to use the Turing Pi to build an even better Raspberry Pi based cluster. With the Turing Pi, you don't have to buy a network switch, a bunch of network cables, a bunch of micro USB cables, a multi port USB power supply, and a bunch of micro SD cards to build your cluster. And then, you don't have to spend an hour wiring everything together and building a case to hold everything like I did with my Raspberry Pi Dramble. The Turing Pi is basically a cluster on a board. This one board has seven slots for seven Raspberry Pi compute modules. A Raspberry Pi compute module is basically a fast Raspberry Pi Model B, but without any built-in I.O. connections. It's on a little chip the same size as standard computer RAM. This is an old 2 gigabyte stick of RAM. This is a Raspberry Pi Zero, and this is a compute module. Similar in size, but they're very different in what they can do. The Turing Pi includes dedicated I.O. connections for the first slot, so you can manage the entire cluster through the Pi in slot 1, or you can manage the cluster externally using another computer. At a minimum, you just need to plug in power and a keyboard and mouse and a monitor, or power and a network cable, and you're off to the races. Before I talk about setting up the Turing Pi, I thought I'd show you how I built my own current Raspberry Pi cluster with four Raspberry Pi 4 Model B computers. I have a full parts list for my current Dramble cluster on the pydramble.com wiki. You need to buy four Raspberry Pi 4 Model B computers, an 8 amp 4 port USB charger, a 5 pack of USB A to C charge cables, four Samsung Evo Plus 32 gig micro SD cards, an 8 port gigabit ethernet switch, and a set of stackable cases to hold everything together. All this will set you back around $300 plus shipping. Once you have everything, it's time to start assembling the parts. I'll head over to my workbench and we can put everything together there. First, if you're using the power over ethernet hat like I am, install the hat onto each Pi board. Since one of the headers on my PoE boards failed the last time I reassembled it, I already have them installed and won't be reinstalling them in this video. Then you'll want to put all the pies into your stackable cases or into some other creative chassis you build. Then you can wire up all the network connections, one cable for each Raspberry Pi. Plug the other end of each cable into your network switch. In my case, because I'm using power over ethernet, my pies get their power straight from the PoE network switch. But if you're not using a PoE switch, you should plug in the USB power connections with one USB cable for each Raspberry Pi. But don't plug the power adapter into the wall yet, because the Pis don't actually have an operating system to boot them. Before we load an OS onto the Raspberry Pis, it's important to think about what you want to do with your cluster. If you want a general purpose cluster running fully supported Raspbian OS from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, you can download Raspbian Lite, which doesn't include a GUI or an interface, just a command line or remote access interface that lets you manage the Pis via SSH. If you want to run certain software that requires 64-bit compatibility, you might need to consider an OS that supports 64-bit on ARM processors, like Ubuntu's 64-bit ARM distribution. If you want to have an OS meant for container workloads, and that's easy to configure headless, like we'll do with the Turing Pi in a little bit, you might want to consider something like Hypriot OS. For my Dramble, I want to run a generic cluster running a fully supported distribution built just for the Raspberry Pi, so I'm sticking with Raspbian. So for each Pi, plug a micro SD card into a card reader attached to another computer. If you have a separate working Raspberry Pi, you can actually use it to flash cards too. Then follow the Raspberry Pi Foundation's instructions for flashing the Raspbian disk image to each micro SD card. Their instructions recommend using the Raspberry Pi Imager app, and there are other GUI alternatives like Etcher, but in my case, I use Terminal on my Mac. Depending on your computer, these instructions might be a little bit different, but here's what I do. First, I insert the micro SD card. Second, I run diskutil-list in the terminal to verify which disk device the card is using. Third, I run diskutil unmount disk slash dev slash disk3 or whatever the device is to unmount the card. You can run this command even if the card isn't mounted on your desktop. You just need to make sure that the disk is unmounted or else the next command after this one will fail. Fourth, 
I run pv and then the disk image name pipe sudo dd bs equals 1m of equals slash dev slash artist3 and enter my admin password to start the flashing process. This command uses the dd utility to directly write the contents of a disk image or ISO to the micro SD card using a block size of one megabyte. I use the pv or progress viewer utility so I can monitor the progress of the copy, but you could drop that and just use dd instead. Fifth, I wait for the flashing process to complete. It takes a few minutes. When it's done, you'll see a boot volume mounted on your desktop. Sixth, I run touch slash volume slash boot slash SSH to create a file on the boot volume that tells the Raspberry Pi to enable SSH access when it first boots up. Seventh, I unmount the card one more time using disk util unmount disk slash dev slash disk three or whatever the disk is. Eighth, I remove the micro SD card. And finally, ninth, I realize it's gonna be a while because I have to do all of that three more times. After all four cards are flashed, insert them into each of the Raspberry Pis. Now, plug in your cluster's power adapter, and after a few minutes, all the Pis should be booted and ready. But for what? Well, the next step is finding them all on your network, connecting to them, and managing them. But for now, I'm gonna skip that part because it's hard. Actually, it's because I want to show you how to do the exact same thing I just did with my Pi using the Turing Pi. The Turing Pi builds the power distribution and networking directly into the main board, so you don't even have to worry about purchasing all the extra cables, USB multiport power supply, or network switch. Instead, all you need is a Turing Pi, a 12 volt power supply that's compatible with the Turing Pi, and seven Raspberry Pi compute modules. I recommend getting the Module 3 Plus, or when it someday becomes available, the 4 or any newer version. And that's all you need. You plug all the compute modules into the Turing Pi, and you're good to go. Except, you may be wondering, what about the operating system? Oh, yeah, well, about that. There are two types of Raspberry Pi compute modules. Ones that have built-in eMMC memory, allowing you to boot the compute module without an external microSD card, and there are ones without built-in eMMC memory, meaning you'd also need to buy an external additional micro SD card, one for each Pi. The Turing Pi works with any compute module, and it also has a micro SD card slot for each Pi, so if you want, you can choose whichever type of compute module fits your needs. I recommend buying the ones with eMMC though, because it's easier to set up and manage in a cluster environment. And you don't have to fill up all the slots on the Turing Pi, you can actually run it with any number of compute modules. You can even hot plug modules, meaning you could add or remove compute modules while the cluster's actually running. So you could build your cluster today with one or two or three compute modules, and as your needs expand or if you need a faster Pi or more eMMC on a Pi, you can add more compute modules or replace existing ones. Pretty neat. In fact, this is something that's commonly seen only in higher end servers, and it's known as blade computing. But as with many things Raspberry Pi, the Turing Pi makes this cool blade technology easy for anyone to use. So back to the topic of operating systems. You'll still need to flash the eMMC on a compute module so it can boot up properly. But how do you do that? You can't plug a compute module into your computer's USB port. The Turing Pi has a built-in USB slave port at the top of the board. This micro USB port can be plugged into another computer to allow the eMMC module on a compute module installed in slot one to be flashed, just like you'd flash a micro SD card in a card, card reader. To put slot one into flash mode, you need to move the top jumper into the position nearest the compute module. Note that the Turing Pi I'm using is actually a prototype, so things might have changed a little bit in the production version. Then you plug the Turing Pi's USB slave port into your computer and power up the Turing Pi board. At this point, it's likely you won't actually see anything happen on your computer. That's because the compute module's eMMC needs to be set up in USB boot mode so it can appear as a USB mass storage device, just like a micro SD card. And lucky you, the Raspberry Pi Foundation has a utility to do just that. I have a separate blog post, which is linked in the description below, that details this process, but here's everything I did. So first, I made sure the Turing Pi was in flash mode. The compute module was firmly seated in slot one. The micro USB slave port was plugged into my computer and the Turing Pi was powered on. Second, I opened my Mac's system report and went to the USB section to make sure the BCM2710 boot device appeared in the list. 
Note that different versions of the compute module appear as different device numbers, but all with the prefix BCM. Third, I downloaded USB boot from the Raspberry Pi Foundation's GitHub repository. I opened up the directory it was in in the terminal and ran make. For this make process to work, I also actually had to have the libUSB library installed on my Mac, which I had installed previously with Homebrew using brew install libUSB. Once the make process finishes, there's a new RPI boot executable, which is what I needed to run to prep the compute module's eMMC for flashing. So fourth, I ran sudo dot slash boot and entered my admin password. This kicks off an automated script which searches for any attached compute modules, then writes a couple files to the eMMC, and then exits. Once it exits, a Mac pops up an alert saying, this disk you inserted was not readable by this computer, but you can click ignore for now. Fifth, I followed the same basic directions as before with microSD cards to flash an OS to the compute module's eMMC storage. For the Turing Pi, I decided to use Hypriot OS, which is a little bit easier to pre-configure for headless servers like the compute module that don't all have connections for HDMI and, and monitors. I ran diskutil-list to see what device the eMMC was mounted as. I unmounted the disk with diskutil-unmount-disk. I wrote the image to the card, again, using PV and DD so I could monitor the progress. The card write actually took, takes a little bit longer with the eMMC than with microSD cards directly. Once it was done, I edited the volumes Hypriot OS user data file using nano. I set the host name to something meaningful in my cluster, like Turing Pi master for the first card, which would act as a Kubernetes master node, or worker-05 for the fifth worker card. You can use whatever naming convention you want, just be consistent. I also pasted in my public SSH key and a new option for the default pirate user. I added the property SSH authorized keys, then added a list item with my personal SSH pub key. If you don't already have a public SSH key, you can check if there's already a file in the path home slash dot SSH slash ID underscore RSA dot pub, then you can create one by doing the following. Run the command SSH keygen dash TRSA dash B 4096 dash C and then your email address and press enter three times. Then an SSH key will magically be generated in the default location. After I finished editing the user data file, I saved the file by pressing control O and closed it with control X. Finally, I ran disk util unmount disk again to eject the compute module. At this point, you can disconnect the USB cable from the Turing Pi Disconnect power, assuming you don't have any other Pis running on the, at the time on the Turing Pi, and remove the compute module from slot one. One Pi down, six to go. Now earlier I mentioned you could hot swap compute modules on a running Turing Pi, but it wouldn't be convenient to have to flash compute modules on the Turing Pi all the time, especially if you have an important node running in slot one and you don't want to shut it down to flash another compute module. Luckily, there are compute module I.O. boards available that can be used to interact with a compute module and flash its eMMC. If you do a lot of work with compute modules, it's a good idea to have one of those boards available. It gives you so many options and makes it easy to boot compute modules on their own and test things on them before even installing them permanently in the Turing Pi. The I.O. board that I have is called the WaveShare Compute Module I.O. Board Plus, and I got mine from Amazon.com. As with everything else, there's a link in the description below. Now that you have all the compute modules ready to boot, wouldn't it be nice to have a sturdy case for your Turing Pi? Well, you're in luck, because the Turing Pi uses an industry standard Mini ITX form factor, meaning it fits perfectly into any Mini ITX computer case. I found this one on Amazon for about 30 bucks, but there are many options if you don't want to build your own case. Now that you have all the compute modules flashed with an OS, and the Turing Pi is mounted and ready to go, you just need to plug in power and a network connection, and boom, you have an edge cluster that's going to change the world. So we have a cluster of Raspberry Pis, or actually a bramble of Raspberry Pis. Now, what are we going to do with it? And how do you even connect to it? To find out, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm going to show you how to connect to the individual nodes, introduce Kubernetes, and get Kubernetes installed on the cluster in the next video. But before I wrap up, I wanted to call out two aspiring young engineers, Lewis and Robert from Houston, Texas. In our current crazy world, their dad reached out and has been asking me some questions about Raspberry Pis and Pi clusters because they're building some different Pi projects and wanted to figure out what to do with the Raspberry Pi.
And discussing things further, I realized what an opportunity for growth and learning they have from a dad who's willing to teach and experiment with them. I can sympathize because I also have a son and two daughters, and I find that their imaginations go way beyond my own. I want to encourage them and try to keep my own brain sharp through these projects. Projects like this cluster help, even if they're not as practical and pragmatic as building a cluster with bigger, faster computers in the cloud. So if nothing else, consider building a cluster like this to be a learning opportunity and to help also inspire a new generation of developers, makers, and hardware hackers. If you liked this video and you want to see more, please consider supporting me on GitHub or Patreon. There are links, you guessed it, in the description below. And if there's anything I missed, or if you have any questions at all about the Turing Pi and clustering, feel free to ask in the comments below. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.